Konnichiwa. Mata kwaru with a kanuto ni yo koso. Kyo wa akaitori to yo bando de yume ni nata kyoko. Takeda no komori uta o hen kyoko shimasho. If you can't tell,、uh, I've got quite a lot of time on my hands these days.、Um, COVID 19 has, I mean, it's done kind of a number on society in general, but for artists, it's been a particularly bad year. And、uh, I've not had nearly as much arranging work as I normally have, you know, not to mention just music work in general. So, that being said, I still. Wanted to do some arranging and I wanted to kind of do some arranging for myself rather than just angle everything at, you know, how to get work and how to do stuff for a very, you know, specific purpose. I just kind of wanted to arrange a song that I like. So the song that we're going to be arranging today is a Japanese folk song. It's called、uh, Takeda no Komori Uta and this kind of roughly translates to、uh, the Takeda lullaby. Takeda being like a region of Japan. I will say that there are a lot of kind of trip wires that I could, you know, trip over for this because I don't actually speak Japanese, nor do I have a particularly big, you know, knowledge of Japanese、um, history. This is、uh, just a song that I like and that I thought would be nice to do an arrangement of. I imagine a lot of people in the West、uh, were probably introduced to the song first in Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, where it's performed by Titus Burgess's character for、um, a, a musical performance that he does. And I think what was quite striking about that scene is just how different it is from、uh, kind of the over, overarching silliness of that series. It's a very silly series, and yet that scene is very. It's very heartfelt, and you know, Titus, Titus Burgess is a fantastic singer, and so it's、um, you know, it just really kind of stands on its own in that show. And、uh, I wanted to kind of learn a bit more about the song, and、uh, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very sad song. It's about a slave girl who's unhappy because she's、uh, kind of working for this family who doesn't treat her right, and all she wants to do is go home to her family. And I thought that was a really nice sentiment. So I thought, you know what, I want to do a little arrangement of this song. Now, one thing I do have is I have a friend who speaks Japanese. Helga,、uh, she lived in Japan for a year and she is、uh, quite good at Japanese actually. So she is going to help me out a little bit, making sure that, my, you know, that I write out the music correctly, that I've got you know,、uh, good pronunciation when we record it. Uh, she was the one who, who wrote out the intro for me. That was not me. So, thank you very much, Helga, for your help. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to transcribe the song. Now, the most famous version of the song was performed by a Japanese folk group called Akai Tori. So, I'm going to kind of start with that version, write out you know, the melody, the,、uh, the harmony, and then I'll、uh, talk about how I'm going to turn that into a choir arrangement. Okay, so I've done the transcription here. Now, this is, I've moved this slightly in key, I'll say why in a minute, but I've kind of I've tried to put down the Japanese text as best I can. Now, I will have to check with Helga here because, of course, of course Japanese text doesn't work quite the same way that our Latin alphabet does because, you know, this sign indicates two syllables and this does as well. and... Uh, this one. So, of course, we don't really do that in our alphabet. You know, our alphabet's quite suited for this. So, I'm not sure quite how they do it in Japanese, but I'm going to check this. So, you know, bear with me.、Um, all I've done is I've just written out the song. Now, you know, there's nothing particularly spectacular here. I've just written in the melody, the text, and then I've written the harmony from the Akaitori version below. And、uh, this is a typical folk song. It has an AAA kind of structure, which means that it's basically the same thing repeated 
over and over. So you have this in a lot of uh, folk music traditions, like uh, you look at English folk music, stuff like Green Sleeves, that's an AAA type song. Scarborough Fair, that's an AA song. It's just the same thing over and over. So that's quite common with folk music. Now, of course, that then poses a challenge for the arranger. How do you make that interesting? Because uh, with verse chorus type songs, you already have inherent interest in the fact that there's new sections of the song happening. There's kind of, you get help from the song uh, because the structure creates interest. Whereas with folk songs that doesn't really happen it's the same thing over and over and they can have i mean some folk songs have like 30 verses and you just you keep going you keep going it's it's insane i think there's a reason why we don't really do that in current pop music <laughs> anyway so my challenge is now how do i create interest there are certain trip wires here when it comes to me a, a white northern european doing an arrangement of a Japanese song. I, and I said this in the very first episode of my show, my specialty is Western classical art music. It's not, you know, folk music from far, the Far East. So I couldn't really do something that's, you know, in a typical Japanese style because I, I don't know what that is. However... Uh, I am going to do something that's more akin to how contemporary composers do folk music arrangements, uh, that is, European folk music arrangements, which is we do interesting stuff with the, with the form, you extend phrases, you shorten, you change the harmony a bit. And I think, unlike a lot of the other arrangements I've done on this series, this is going to be a lot more classical in nature. And I think what helps me here as well is the fact that Helga is an amazing singer who can very easily sing, you know, in any kind of style. I mean, to be honest, most of the things I work with can do this. Therese as well. You know, they just, you, you say classical, they're like, whoa, they say classical, they're like, yeah. So <laughs> this isn't um, going to be a problem. Um, but I need to kind of play to my strengths and my strengths are not going to be make this as authentically Japanese as possible it's not going to work and also I'm going to be singing it and everyone's going to hear that I'm not Japanese so let's not let's not go there let's instead let's let's appropriate <laughs> if we can use such a word uh this piece and create more a um something along the lines of say John Rutter for instance has done a lot of really nice arrangements of English folk songs and um I think even Carl Jenkins has like a few really nice bits of Japanese stuff in his music. And it's very, you know, it's not, it, it's very much Western. So it is, you kind of, you use maybe the poetry, the, the, the text of a different tradition, but you kind of incorporate it into your own. So you don't, you know, you go around and creating stuff that, that, that kind of passes, it's, passes itself off as being something else. I am going to do... And in fact, I've already done uh, a dynamics graph because that's going to be vital for this kind of arrangement. So if you get to this up here, essentially starts quiet, grows up towards the, the second verse, and then you have massive climax in the third one to go out on a really quiet note at the end. So you have like this very clear curve going up and then down. I decided I wanted to start with a solo. What's really nice uh, when you do any kind of arrangement really is to have some solo moments, whether it be, you know, unison solo moments or uh, genuine solo moments. So, of course, in this case, uh, I'm going to be recording this one to a part with Halka, and so that's going to be a solo, you know, uh, no matter what. But uh, for the sake of doing a choir arrangement, I'm probably going to make the first verse indicated as a solo, and then the rest will probably be ensemble voices. That being said, I mean, once I start arranging stuff is likely to change i'll get new ideas i'll you know be i'll get my creative juices going and i'll i'll invent something else so um i think i'm just gonna get started see what happens maybe it turns out fantastic and uh just completely effortless maybe not we'll see <laughs>
Okay, I think I'm pretty much finished with my arrangement. So uh, I've done the layout and everything now. And um, um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of go through and, you know, tell you what I did, why I did it and so on. I think just for the sake of making things ultra clear, I am going to use um, panorama mode here. Um, I didn't really do any complicated splits or anything, so it just makes the structure real clear. Right, intro. Now, I went with this kind of high, tingly piano thing with a bit of melody coming in here. I'll zoom in a little bit, actually. A little bit of uh, melody. I really quite like starting in kind of the extremities of the piano when I do this kind of music, uh, because a lot of music uh, tends to be quite mid-range centered, and, you know, for good reason, because that's kind of, that's the part, that's that's the sonic space that sounds the most rich. But then that creates a nice opportunity to make your arrangement sound a bit different by playing in extremities. Now, keep in mind, this is the piano extremities, not the voice extremities. So uh, the piano is not going to have any trouble playing this uh, <laughs> A above top A pianissimo. Um, a soprano uh, might have a bit more trouble with it. Anyway, that's besides the point. This is what I like to call the one day more motif. It's just the descending, uh, descending arpeggio. And um, it's not just in One Day More from Le Mis. It's definitely, you know, quite a common thing, but that's kind of the most memorable place I've heard it used. So here I'm just kind of playing the melody accompanied with harmonies above. Then we have this big descending thing happening. And then melody continues here and then back up. So you just... It starts high, goes down, boom, loud, up again, and then back to quiet. Uh, there's some stuff I did to the harmony here, but I think I'll probably talk more about it as we get into the actual song. Here, crossed hands, which I like to do. The left hand does the chord, and then some twinkly notes above the right hand. And again. Right. Optional solo. Sings the song. I added a little 2-4 bar here, and this is just like to make it a bit more loose in form. A lot of folk music isn't really written in a strict meter the same way uh, we do now. Now music tends to be kind of 4-4-3-4. Four, four, four. Um, back before the, you know, the formal notation system was de developed, a lot of music wouldn't really have a meter. And so uh, I don't know if this is the case for Japanese music, but certainly this is the case for European music. And so I decided to incorporate a bit of this. Not, you know, nothing extreme, but I just added a little extra bit of beats here. Linger on that ru um, syllable there. And then continue on. Now I'm just kind of following the harmony of the Akaritori version here, not really changing much. It's when I get to the final phrase that I do this thing. This chord, G, uh, would have been a B flat in the original. Now, this is something you will see in a lot of European folk music again. European folk music tends to be modal. And modal means that it doesn't really employ the tonic dominant kind of uh, effect that we use in uh, current music to create tension and create and release tension. Instead, the scale used is what kind of creates the interest of the song. And a lot of, um, you know, pre-Renaissance music and even you know, right up to the Renaissance, would be using different modes. Uh, this one would be the Dorian mode, where you have a sharpened sixth step in a minor key, which sounds very, that sounds very English. That sounds like, you know, like Scarborough Fair. <laughs> um, and it does exist throughout kind of European music from that time. But I thought, okay, by employing uh, this mode, I am making it sound more like folk music. And if you want to you know, be cool if you're writing music, if you want it to sound like broad and epic and big. Film, film composers love to use the Dorian mode. It sounds very broad and magical. Um, what's another? If you listen to like the Halo theme, the Halo theme, that's in the Dorian mode and that's a plain chant song as well. And, you know, they that's done very deliberately to make it give it that broad epic sound. So I've done the same here uh, using the Dorian mode. Okay, so the same thing, twinkly bit happens. Now I'm getting into um, ensemble voices. Now here, I so typically if you use 
a modal approach to arranging, you want to avoid too strong, like tonic, dominant tonic kind of motion. So I avoided putting a dominant here. Normally, you know, if you wanted to have a strong move to that F here, you'd want to have sort of a, a, a C dominant here. That would sound a little too strong for modal music. So I decided to instead just have that C happen as an extension of the D minor chord, but then just move straight to F. And it's just, that's just more in the, in the style. Okay, so now this is more kind of normal accompaniment where you just have kind of mid-range low chords happening and then they're just singing oohs, they're just filling out the harmony and then it's like sopranos and then unison, uh, sorry, ensemble voices in choral harmony. Nothing too strange here. It's just, you know, uh, oohs, harmonies, oohs, harmonies um, with the melody in the sopranos. There's nothing particularly interesting to speak of. I can say that it's kind of, it's generally in a mid to low range here. It's not loud yet. I'm saving that for the third verse. Now here, you see I'm kind of preparing by having this kind of uh, accompaniment figure in the left hand. This is just about okay with a bit of practice. It's not super hard and the, the right hand's pretty simple anyway. I wrote um, a counter melody in the piano and then I have mostly the melody happening in the altos here because I want to have the sopranos up high and I try to have all the voices generally a lot higher. So for instance here when they've got the modi wa bai jiru, that's when everyone's up in their high range. So you've got altos approaching belt area, you've got sopranos up in their high notes and so on and so forth. Um, again, this is just to make it to make it easier to get it loud. You, um, it's much easier to sing loud and high than it is to sing low and high, and it's also much easier to sing low and quiet than it is to sing high and quiet. So here, you know, bass is up on D. You've got uh, yeah, they're like the altos are up on the C for a bit. You can get a lot more kind of loud, exciting sounds out of them by writing them high here. Stays kind of high. You've got the little counter melody. The counter melody is up in a super high range. Again, I'm trying to kind of keep it away from the space where the singers are. So this is decidedly above them so that it will still stick out. Um, cool. As they get quieter here, I move back to my one day more uh, <laughs> motif with the twinkling high bits, the crossed hands. And here. Sempre pee pee. Quiet for the rest of the song. And here it's just unison octaves. And I think this is kind of nice. It's basically the same thing as in the beginning, uh, you know, including the extra 2 4 bar, to make it sound kind of a bit more spooky and haunting. In terms of the text, before this, the main characters is kind of, they've been singing, oh, I don't have, a, a, I don't have any nice clothes to go to the festival. The baby that I'm caring for is mean and crying, and it's just, I'm miserable. I wish I were home. And this is the bit where she goes, I want to be, I want to go across the mountain to see my family. I think I can see their house in the distance. Something to that effect. Again, I'm, don't, I don't speak Japanese, so I could get it completely wrong. But that's the sentiment. This is when she's like, I want to go, you know, and she's looking, she's looking into the middle distance and she's like, I want to go home to my family <laughs> and I think that's kind of nice to do in a hushed pianissimo um, uh, style here with a very sparse accompaniment um, yeah they just kind of do this sing it all boom all the way out to the end of the song here and this is where the text ends but then in the Akaitori version they do a repeat I can't remember if they do their repeat a cappella or not, but I decided to do mine a cappella. Where you just, and this is just a very simple choral harmony. It's nothing spectacular, but it is going to sound very nice um, after the drama of the unison octaves and the high bits here. Just choral harmony, boom, 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 ends in, and then you end up in unison octaves with the last little bit of this motif happening. And that's basically it. And this took me, I don't know, four hours maybe to arrange something including the writing out of the of the, um, of the layout see I've already done already done the layouts here and it's all 
ready. As I said, I will have to check with Helga regarding the Japanese text because I want to make sure that I'm not. Uh, I want this to be, you know, available for a Japanese choir to perform if they want to, even though that's not kind of my initial purpose was for me and Helga.、Um, but yeah, there's the song. <laughs> Okay, so、uh, I asked Helga about the lyrics, and、uh, it actually turns out that、uh, in Japanese they do actually write out lyrics the same way we do in the West,、uh, but they have an entirely different set of kanji that represent the syllables. So you can see, if we go in, for instance, at the solo here, there's now there's one sign per syllable. Now, this is actually、uh, this is pretty much what we do in. The West, except for us, of course, a syllable will be more like the text underneath, where you have several signs per syllable. But because this is a, you know, this is a limitation kind of of, of kanji, is you don't always know how to divide up the syllables within one, sing one single sign. They just use an entirely different、uh, set of symbols. There's some words like born, and in Japanese, sometimes n can be its own kind of its own syllable. Sometimes you will. Join those together, and then I just inserted them with this little, <laughs> this little、um, liaison kind of thing that we use in, in、uh, the Latin alphabet as well.、But、yeah, no, she, <laughs> so Helga, she just went above and beyond. She wrote out the entire song in syllables for me to just copy paste. It's just, I think Helga is the the, the MVP of the, <laughs> of this arrangement.、Um, see, I've just done that for the whole thing.、Um, By now, I've also recorded the piano part, and so I did、uh, some minor changes, a few places, just to make it a little bit easier to play. But it's more or less exactly as before. I decided here, so you see, when people do this, it means all all the parts congregate、uh, into a single staff、uh, like this because they're singing in unison octaves. So it's a bit of a waste to have, you know, separate staves when it's all <laughs> unison octaves. Um, and I just kind of kept this for the rest because, as Helga told me, it's customary when you do this to divide up the the lyrics into syllables to provide the actual full lyrics with the correct kanji so that singers can then see what is the actual meaning of the sounds because sometimes that might be ambiguous. And so here it's all written out. Now again, this is just I've just copied this from Wikipedia. It could be. You know, it could be completely wrong, but I'm kind of trusting that it's probably it's probably correct. And、uh, a, a rough translation again, just nicked it off of <laughs> for Wikipedia, but just like so people can see and then get to the sentiment of the song. It's not just syllables; there's actual words behind it. But yeah, that is basically it. So the next thing will be、um, to record it, and、um, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to get one out in a few weeks' time. So <laughs> yeah, and again. Big thanks to Helga for helping me here. This really could not have、uh, looked as good as it does if it weren't for her help. That's it for today's episode. Be sure to leave me a comment if you have any questions, or if you have some comments, maybe about the history of the song. If there's something that you think I should know, I'd be quite interested to learn more. And my goal is to record a simple version with Helga. So、uh, fingers crossed, we'll be able to. Put one out in a few weeks so that you can hear what the arrangement ends up sounding like. And as always, be sure to share this video with your friends if you think they'll find it useful, and subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next episode of Choir with Knut. Ah.